you actually raised what I consider one of the most important issues, and that is the failure of people to appreciate plants. When I give lectures on this topic, I often begin by asking the audience if they notice the plants in the lobby or as they entered the hall, and nobody ever does. And there, there could be trees and flowers and things out in the hallway or whatever, but people tend to think of plants as furniture because they're, relatively speaking, inanimate. And that's a mistake. Welcome to Anthropomania. I'm Jay Ingram. Anthropomania is the podcast that shines a light on the human habit of seeing all wildlife in human terms, whether that life is animal or vegetable or even microbial. And joining me as usual, the other anthropomaniacs, Nikki Wilson and Erica Seren. And I'm going to challenge you both right off the top. Nikki, you first. You're sitting there at your microphone. Are there plants around you? Yes, Jay. I have a beautiful trailing ivy in my room who I talk to. You know, I'm like, hey, buddy, do you need some water? And uh, it grows like crazy. It feels the love, I'm telling you. Yeah, and I have a uh, ficus to the left of me, but um, I don't talk to it, and it's kind of dying right now. Oh, Erica, no love. What, are you treating it like furniture? You know what? I kind of do treat it like furniture. I mean, they're nice to look at, but there's not that much action going on there. Because I'm recording in a clothes closet, there are actually no plants in here. Uh, But my plants, the plants I care about the most, are outside. I've transplanted a bunch of trees from a friend's property to my front yard, and I don't talk to them, I don't think, but I think about them a lot, and there's a little cluster of aspens, and aspens are known for being really just one tree, even though it looks like six. For those of you who are feeling a bit plant blind, Erica, looking at you, we're going to bring you over to the green side before this episode is over. If for no other reason, then we simply wouldn't be here without plants. From lush rainforests to vast prairie grass fields to wetland plants like lilies, plants are the lungs of the earth and we eat them to live, like pure and simple. I had a bouquet of lilies in my house a couple of weeks ago. And they give off this strong, strong scent at night. And that's not for me. That's because they evolved with insects and other pollinators that come at night. And they're sending chemical messages to these insects. I wonder if they feel frustrated about that. There they are. They're in your house. There's no pollinators. They're in my house in the dark, cold Jasper winter. So plants have these incredible abilities, many of which have evolved because they are literally rooted to the ground. And it seems like each year we learn they are capable of something we couldn't even have imagined a decade ago. The idea of plants being these complex species is actually a pretty old idea, like Charles Darwin in the 1800s old. Any field of science that can go back to Charles Darwin is a plus. He actually wrote about this root brain hypothesis where he believed that plants were almost upside down animals with their brains on the bottom, deep underground where their roots are, sensing and responding to all the things around it. That's a very cool idea, but I'm going to jerk us from the 1880s to the 1970s. The publication of a book called The Secret Life of Plants. Yeah, I've heard about this one before. Okay, 1973. I'll just give you one example. A guy named Cleve Baxter, who was a polygraph, a lie detector expert, claims to have been fiddling around in his lab one night and thought, you know, I can use the polygraph to see if I water the plant, how fast the moisture gets up into the leaves. So he he attaches the clips to the plant and waters the plant. Nothing happens. So in a leap of imagination, he says, what if I hurt the plant? Now, why would you think that? But anyway... He uh, put a leaf in boiling water, dipped it in boiling water, nothing. So he said, I'm going to set it on fire. And he didn't have any matches at hand. So he went out to get them, came back. As soon as he came back in the room, the polygraph clipped to the plant went nuts. And he concluded... It knew. He (laughs) concluded... No, (laughs) really. He concluded that the plant had read his mind, that he was going to torture it, and it was in a panic. I need not give you any more examples of this. But anyway, that was uh, in the 1970s. 
So that's all going on in the 70s. And meanwhile, back in science land, a couple of ecologists named Jack Schultz, who you heard off the top of the show, and his then graduate student, Ian Baldwin, published some research on the chemistry of tree leaves, which ruffled a lot of feathers in the plant science community. And this was a serious turning point, not just for science, but for Schultz and Baldwin themselves. My name is Ian Thomas Baldwin. As a very young scientist, I got involved in some research that demonstrated for the first time there was aerial communication between plants. In our title in the science paper that it was published on, it, we used the word communication, and that was a very unfortunate choice of words because probably eavesdropping was a more evolutionarily appropriate interpretation of that, of that response. And that over-interpretation of the data led to a good bit of pushback from the plant physiology community. And uh, there has been some resistance to the idea that plants are as responsive as they, they clearly are now. When you study plants from a largely agronomic perspective, then you think of them as largely photosynthetic machines that were there selected by humans to produce certain goods um, and not really as individual organisms that are just like all other life on the planet, trying to move their genome forward in time and doing it in the most amazing ways because natural selection is just an amazingly creative process. So it was a bit of a rough start for Baldwin's career. By the way, he has since made very important discoveries about plants. But the fact that plants communicate and even learn has taken a while to take hold. But how far does it go? Does it mean that plants are intelligent? Do they understand concepts? In the world of plant science, this is the controversy. Exactly. And the media at the time really played up the talking plants angle. But, you know, plant behavior is complex, and so is knowing the best language to describe it. Nikki, you mentioned Jack Schultz, Ian Baldwin's supervisor at the time. He actually found a silver lining in the snafu, got people thinking and talking about plant behavior. My name is Jack Schultz. I am a chemical or molecular ecologist. I study ways in which plants respond to and defend themselves against insects and other threats. I think the problem that we all experience here is that plants and animals often do things that appear so complex that we can't imagine them doing those things without the kind of nervous system and complex abilities that humans have. And of course, that leads us to assign them terms, names, definitions that come from human behavior. Are plants solving problems? Well, they certainly are. All organisms solve problems, and the question becomes, do we need intelligence to solve problems? Uh, and the answer is no. We, you know, bacteria wouldn't exist if, you, if they needed intelligence to solve problems, and yet they solve problems all the time. So in the sense of uh, being able to acquire information, in a sense aware of the environment, and respond to it in an appropriate way, Plants do all of those things. I think what has surprised people is the uh, complexity of responses that plants exhibit. And, you know, it sort of forces us to give them a brain, and it's probably not appropriate. But you've shown that plants uh, can actually alert the enemies of the insects that are feeding on them, right? Yeah, uh, we discovered that uh, way back in the early 80s, and it was quite a surprise. But since then, uh, as you might imagine, it's gotten a huge amount of attention. Hundreds of papers have been published on that phenomenon. One of the responses that plants mount when they're uh, attacked by an insect, usually, is that they begin producing molecules that travel through the air. We call them volatiles or volatile organic compounds, uh, many of which are familiar to us. The smell of jasmine flowers, uh, that molecule is a signal that's emitted actively by plants when they're attacked. The smell of wintergreen is another of those. And in, in those two cases, if we expose a happy, healthy plant to the odor of jasmine flowers, it becomes more resistant to enemies because that signal turns on its defenses. If we expose a happy, healthy plant to the odor of wintergreen, that plant turns on defenses against microbes and becomes more resistant to disease. Now, the question quickly becomes, are plants doing this to warn each other? Well, do they communicate that to other plants? The major advantage or the major benefit to plants of uh, producing these volatiles has nothing to do with interacting with other plants. It has to do with calling in friends. When uh, our caterpillar chews a leaf and these volatile compounds are emitted, 
enemies of the caterpillar can find that caterpillar more readily by following the odor trail to it. If you think about this for a minute, uh, imagine a smallish caterpillar probably tunneling through an ear of corn in the middle of a huge field of corn. The task of finding that caterpillar among all of these corn plants is amazing. I mean, if you ask me, the main enemy of a caterpillar, main enemies, will be a huge number of species of tiny little wasps that find their host caterpillar and lay eggs in it. The eggs hatch and the larvae of the wasp consume the caterpillar. And that's a critical component of biocontrol, not only in agriculture, but in nature. If those wasps weren't as efficient as they are, we'd be up to our eyeballs in caterpillars. That makes them sound more like us than I thought. I'm quoted often as saying that plants are very slow animals. That's true in the sense that plants seem to possess at least as many sensory modalities as animals do, and maybe more. For example, the kind of proteins that uh, that you and I use in our taste buds to taste things, we have, uh, you know, fewer than a dozen or so. Plants have 200 or 300 taste bud proteins. So but just because they're standing there doesn't mean they're, you know, they're not doing things. And what I wish we could do is get the message across that plants live a very dynamic life. It's just very difficult to see because they do it in ways that we're not sensitive to. Well, man is the measure of all things. And anything that takes longer than humans do is very difficult to appreciate. Yeah, we call that here anthropomania. <laughs> yes, I think that's a great word choice. You know, they may have known this for a long time, that plants send out chemicals in the air to attract the enemies of the caterpillars eating them. But I still think it's fantastic. Now, it may not say they're intelligent, but it still is pretty awesome that they can do this. How about the fact that they have two to 300 taste bud proteins that I guess they use as a way of sensing chemicals? Those experiments that he described are fantastic, but there are new experiments going on all the time. There was an Israeli experiment recently that showed if you dry plants out or cut them, they emit ultrasonic cries. Well, somebody used the word cries. <laughs> I won't attest to that. But here's the issue. It hasn't been peer-reviewed, hasn't been officially published, hasn't been really examined by other scientists, but it's so provocative. I mean, if that were true, I am never mowing the lawn again. Like the shrieks of pain. <laughs> yeah, pruning has a whole new meaning when I'm thinking about my shrubs. That Israeli study is one of many being published on the amazing abilities of plants. And one of the most high-profile, even controversial researchers who's really pushing the boundaries in plant science is Monica Galliano. Galliano's experiments are, are simple yet really provocative. So one of them was put pea plants in a setup where there's no actual water with them, but there is the sound of water. And the roots of those plants will start to grow toward the sound. So what she's demonstrating, very simply, it's not a chemical attraction. There's no water there. Pea plants detect water by its sound. And that wasn't all that this experiment showed. There were options where the plants had sound coming from both directions of the maze. But in one direction, you would have the sound of water, which is, of course, of interest to the plant. And on the other direction, you might have like a noise, like white noise. But its ability to find the water then is compromised a bit because the white noise is almost like a bit confusing. It's like there is, there is noise around. It just shows that they're not just uh, automatic systems that is like, oh, yeah, plants know how to find water. So they're just automatically going for the sound of water. But actually, no, they are discerning different, between different sounds and different possibilities and choosing the one that is most appropriate to them. What Dr. Galliano is doing here with plants is roughly the same idea as the famous Pavlov's dogs experiments. So what Pavlov did is he would ring a bell and then give a treat to his dogs, who would then salivate as a reflex to the treat. These dogs eventually became conditioned in such a way that they would salivate at the sound of the bell, even when a treat wasn't given. Dr. Galliano, she's studying plants in a similar manner, conditioning them to turn towards a fan because they've been trained to associate a breeze with light. In the dog experiment, what Pavlov did was presenting a bell, which I substituted with the fan for my peas, before presenting dinner to the dog. Now, at the end of a few iterations of this, uh, the dog starts salivating in expectation of dinner just by the sound of the bell. So dog, the dog has this idea that dinner is coming. The plants are doing exactly the same. In my experiments, you know, the, the bell was substituted by the fan, 
and the blue light was equivalent of dinner. And after a few iterations, the fan alone is allowing the plants to make the decision and predict basically where is expecting the light to come next. Like in the dog experiment, in my Pavlov experiment for the peas, the light is nowhere to be seen. And yet the plant is moving in the, in the correct direction, uh, expecting the light to come from there. Where are these uh, decisions and expectations being made? Who is making them, really, is the question that I'm mostly interested in. Is like, who is making this, uh, who is building this expectation? Who is dreaming of dinner coming or light coming? Who is, who is there? You do have skeptics, obviously, because you're pushing the experiments in a direction that I think a lot of people are uncomfortable with. So how do you go about persuading, if indeed you have to, people who, for them, it's a step too far to think of a plant having concepts? I just present my data and then it's up to them to make their own mind. I'm not trying to convince anyone. I'm just doing my science and presenting my findings, which is what scientists are supposed to be doing. But like everyone, I have my own personal opinion, my own personal experiences that guide and inform how I read what I see, how I interpret what I see. I'm not afraid to say that these experiments with the peas were, in my view, co-created with the plants themselves. And I actually don't think any scientist could actually engage with the world in any way without imagining. And imagining not in the sense of like, oh, seeing, you know, um, things that are don't, they're not there and, and making up stories, uh, but imagining in the real sense of like uh, uh, allowing for the mind to open to all possibilities. Well, I love what she says about imagination. It kind of reminds me of an Einstein quote where he says, I am enough of an artist to draw freely upon my imagination. Imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. Imagination encircles the world. That's really cool. And Dr. Galliano publishes in, in peer-reviewed journals. So when she talks about creativity and imagination, she is going beyond the data. But that's the way she approaches her work. And uh, I think those are really important things to say, whether every scientist who reviews her work agrees with her. And she's not denying that science is an important and powerful tool for discovery and that there's a set of methodologies we need to follow if we're going to stay within the bounds of science. Um, but what she's saying, I think, is that outside of that, she's informed by these other experiences and sort of hunches she has about what plants might be able to do. And you have to remember that science is on the cutting edge. We're exploring things that have never been explored before. So imagination is almost crucial to see new things in, in data. You know, it really strikes me when she's talking about her work right now that what she's experiencing in terms of kind of skepticism or pushback from the science establishment might be a little bit what Baldwin and Schultz experienced when they introduced the concept of plant communication. I think so, too. And I would like to differentiate this, though, from those lines that I read earlier from The Secret Life of Plants, where they, they said that Cleve Baxter, the lie detector guy, was looking for ways to satisfy the, quote, rigid criteria of the scientific establishment, unquote. This is very different. You know, this is real science that she's doing. She's not just writing a book. And yet it has echoes of the same kind of thing. It's almost like the sticking point here is the language that she's using to describe that real science. Specifically, any sort of connection between plants and neurology has a sort of visceral reaction to certain scientists. In 2005, a group of scientists actually tried to create an entire scientific journal that connected the two called the Journal of Plant Neurobiology. Do you know what that journal is actually called these days? What? What? Plant signaling and behavior. Wah, wah. They've backed away from the neurobiology. Yeah, it seemed that scientists just weren't comfortable with talking about plants in the context of neurology. They don't have neurons, so they can't have nervous systems. So you really see how words become really important in the scientific debate. But, you know, words are important everywhere. 
full stop. I mean, when we're talking about plants in other cultures, there's entirely different vocabularies and ways of using words that change our sense of relationship to the things we're talking about. I think that this is a a really great point, again, to speak about the difference between the languages. That's Shalyn Jowdhury. She's a Mi'kmaq artist and conservation ecologist from Bear River First Nation in southwest Nova Scotia. I don't necessarily think that it is the word itself in English, but the way that we use that word, the way that the context and the nuance that we put on those words. So how do we use the word it? What are the feelings that we have when we say it, that rock, it, or it, that cat? You know, I I saw a cat cross by. Oh yeah, what color was it? You know, not what color was she or he? So in Mi'kmaq, as much as I've been learning, Negam is third person. And that third person can actually also be referred to any animal or a whole plant, like a whole tree is that third person. How can we change the way that we speak? Maybe we can use the word it in a more loving, humble way. Uh, But if we need to bring in more words from other languages into English, so be it, because actually that is what language is supposed to be, is that we adopt uh, different words from other other languages. And so if we start to use the Mi'kmaq word negam for them, and actually doesn't have gender, it's not male or female, negam is just simply third person, but it could also be a fir tree. it's really important for us to take this moment and humble ourselves. And our elders talk about humbling ourselves to recognize, realize, acknowledge that we are part of this whole landscape and ecosystem. And we are not more important than because we have certain capabilities that other animals don't, or that we're able to manipulate the plant life and the plant world in in ways. But we cannot do very many things that the plants can do. Shallon talked to me about the importance of something that's known in her community as two-eyed seeing, where science respects and collaborates with other ways of knowing to better our knowledge and treatment of the natural world. Two-eyed seeing, it was a philosophical concept to, to show that you need the two different ways of not just looking, but of doing something, of, of having that perspective and worldview. It's funny that some of the research going on now, it mimics some of the things that our elders have talked about. We have a Mi'kmaq elder who said a long time ago that if you look beneath the soil, you'll see that all these different plants are holding hands. We've all shared that teaching. We we refer to Charlie Labrador saying this. And it's so funny now to be listening to the research coming out that is explaining how they are holding hands and communicating. Unfortunately, what's happening is that some Indigenous teachings aren't believed until mainstream science has a way to articulate what's really happening or why. What I'm hoping is that there will be a way in the future for us to listen to our Indigenous elders and just take their advice and guidance forward without knowing how that works, but just having that trust and faith in thousands of years of story and experience and vision being carried on from one generation to the next. I, for one, could listen to Shalin's voice all day. I also love what she said about humility, being able to listen to many different sources of wisdom on plants and their values and their capabilities. And I think it's probably not just the Mi'kmaq, but Indigenous cultures across the world. They bring such a diversity of knowledge about all these really specific ecosystems we're still learning about. And, you know, diversity, I think, can be even extended a little bit beyond what you just said, Nikki. So, yes, diversity of Indigenous peoples around the world. Add to that the diversity of voices in what we would call traditional Western science. Included among that group, people like Monica Galliano, who are actually pushing the boundaries actively of that kind of science. When you look at that incredible amount of diversity focused on a topic like 
the life of plants, then you really get a sense of what the potential is. And if we help make them work together, it could be incredible. And it's interesting to see that research is just catching up to what the Indigenous elder, Charlie Labrador, knew all along. What if we listened to him instead of the secret life of plants? Where would we be today? Well, you know, and this connectedness he speaks to that's under the soil is um, something that I've been thinking about as we've listened to all this wisdom come out about plants, because have we lost our connection with plants and the natural world to a certain extent? We know that people who live in wilderness or who are connected to wilderness share microbes and other connections to those places. And those things keep us healthy. So that's part of how we evolved. And these connections to plants are quite important to our well-being. Okay. You did mention the secret life of plants. and I knew you were going to come back to that, Jay. And Nikki did just use the word wilderness. And I think if you were reading the secret life of plants instead of listening to elders like Charlie Labrador, you are off in the wilderness. And let's just finally put the secret life of plants to bed. We started this show on a personal note. How has everything you've heard today changed your attitude, if at all? Maybe what I'm going to do after this is I'm going to pitch a tent next to my ficus, wait for eight weeks and see if anything cool happens. You, Nikki? Well, this time of year, what I love to do is get all my seeds ordered and then get all my starter plants going. So the living room is about to have shelves set up by the big south-facing window and let the miraculous germination begin. I'm thinking of uh, walking past one of my plants and thinking, I'm going to get a match. I'm going to just burn this leaf. It's dark, man. Yeah, don't forget your polygraph test. I, uh, but I need, yeah, I need, I need a polygraph. But you guys knocked me out today because you were quoting the greats. And I have a George Orwell quote, which sounds like it was written for this episode of Anthropomania. You ready for this? Quote, the revolution will be complete when the language is perfect. Mic drop. End scene. (laughs) Well, this has been kind of a splendid podcast. You know, so many different points of view. So many ways of thinking about plants that we never did before. So thanks, Nikki and Erica, as usual. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. And big thanks to today's guests, Jack Schultz, Shalon Jodry, Monica Galliano, and Ian Baldwin. Did you enjoy this episode? If you did, please follow us on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss an episode. As always, we appreciate it if you leave us a positive review. There's also a listener survey in our show notes. We love getting your feedback. And you know, we have a lot of fun over on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. So join us there and see what the anthropomaniacs are up to. You'll also find the entire episode on YouTube. Just search Anthropomania on that platform. Now, if that's not enough, and you're craving more Anthropomania content... We've got you covered over on our blog, anthropomania.com. There you can sign up for the weekly newsletter and find a ton of great content, including articles from the Anthropomania team. And our next episode, Aliens Among Us. And it's not what you might think. Hope you join us for that. Bye for now. I'm Jay Ingram. And this very large, well over 400 pound male wild pig with a collar on it bulldogged itself under that ice and snow and didn't move. No matter helicopters, snowmobiles, people here in the plane buzzing it that didn't budge. And he found it like five feet away from where he was tying his boot.